to the Child Psych Podcast. I'm Tanya Johnson. And I'm Tammy Schmoon. We're registered psychologists, registered play therapists, co-founders of the Institute of Child Psychology. Today, we're going to be chatting about divorce and separation. Divorce is Tammy's one of Tammy's specializations. She has both professional experience and lived experience in this area. Tammy, we're so excited to chat today. Yeah, this is definitely an area that I could go on and on about just because for, oh my goodness, 10 years, that was my primary caseload other than trauma, which really that overlaps sometimes. And then my parents went through divorce and then I went through, um, I wasn't married at the time, but a separation um, from my, my son's father. And then we did, I now have blended families. So it's been It's interesting being a child of divorce and then going through a separation and then also working with that population. So at this point, I feel um, there's a lot to be said about it. Um, Good, the good, the bad and the ugly of it. Beautiful. Well, maybe, maybe we start with a, what do you want to start with? The good, the bad or the ugly? (laughs) Well, (laughs) the, I guess I I think people think of uh, divorce and separation can traumatize kids. And it, it definitely can be really hard on kids. Like absolutely it can. But I also know a lot of kids that are going to be just fine. It's all about how parents handle the separation, how they handle the divorce. Um, the, the biggest problem is when we get into high conflict uh, divorce and separation issues. And that's where I used to come in and do a lot of work um, with uh, custody and I would do work with voice of the child assessments and mediation with clients. And that's where it becomes very traumatic for kids. But if parents like kind of are very intentional about how they, they navigate divorce and separation, um, kids are, will bounce back as long as their parents really can be their compass in terms of um, all those yucky feelings that kind of come up and all the overwhelm that comes up. And so I, I think today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the the main kind of the advice I give parents and knowing I've lived it and I know what really can work. And then some of the things can be, they don't always work the way we think they're going to work. Mm-hmm. I love what you said there, as long as the parents are the compass and what I'm hearing from you loud and clear, it's not divorce that causes trauma. It's how we divorce that matters. Yeah. I think if you're going to think a child is half of one parent and half of the other. And this is like the first thing I tell parents, like they sit in my office and they're booking, you know, they want their kids to come in. And I said, I want to be very clear. I'm going to be talking to your kids about their feelings about mom and dad. We're going to be talking about what it's like to go back and forth. I'm going to be giving you recommendations. Um, And normally I don't give recommendations off the bat, but I'm going to give you one simple thing that is like the golden rule of moving forward in this process. We never speak poorly about the other parent, period. I don't care what that parent did. It That child is half of each parent. And when a child hears that parent talking poorly about the other parent, even if it's just to their friends, you know, it's snide comments. While they think they're putting down their ex-spouse, they're actually putting down the child at the same time, because that child is half that person. And no matter what that parent has done to that, their spouse or to the child, there is a sense of loyalty that still exists. There's a sense of needing connection and needing um, to believe that parent is still good because if the parent's not good, children feel like there's part of them that's not good because Mm -hmm. they are half that parent. So if we can follow that golden rule, and put our feelings aside, even when we feel frustrated with that other parent, because it's going to come up, is knowing you chose that person. And this is the consequences. So we are choosing to exit in a way that honors um, our child mm-hmm. and their needs. Yeah, makes so much sense. Makes so much sense. I think too, when we bring it back to people's kids and we go, actually, it's not the mom that you're putting down on the dad. It's that half of that kid. It just, it hits home so much harder. Yeah. And I know I, I don't want to use the term because there's a lot of negative connotations with who coined the term parental alienation. So I want to be careful with that term. However, I feel that there are parents that exist that whether it's unconscious or conscious do put down the other parent in the hopes that the child will side with them. And I think that's one of the most damaging things you can do is to, um, 
prevent that child from, or trying to sabotage that child's love for the other parent. Mm. Um, we look at a lot of negative outcomes with kids who have had parents do that, including higher risk for anxiety and depression, suicidality, drug use, dropping out of high school, uh, self-harm. Um, it's not good, <laughs> mm-hmm. no matter how we frame it. Um, but that seems to be um, often why parents would seek out um, help is they were estranged from their children and because they have one parent um, doing everything they can to prevent that relationship from happening. And I know that's going to speak to some parents listening. And it's it's very, there's so much grief and resentment and there's just all kinds of stuff bottled up that parents are probably bringing into this conflict. But we're just trying so hard to keep the kids at the forefront and trying to keep our issues separate. We go deal with our issues in counseling. Yeah. We go we go talk to someone else. We don't bring our kids into it if we can okay. help it. I think I think it's so hard for parents when they're in the middle of it. So when mm-hmm. there's so many feelings and we probably have some of our own trauma history and we're going, but this is how I truly feel about his mother or her father. It can be so hard to actually step outside of that and go, no, this is not what's best for my kid. Or they don't need to know all of this. They don't need to uh, be, be experiencing these microaggressions from me. So microaggressions are things like the sigh or the eye roll. All of those things we know impact kiddos negatively. Yeah, and you're going to have moments where you do screw up. I'm thinking of one in particular where I was very frustrated. So I have a blended family. Um, most people have heard this on our podcast where I am married. And so there's I have two stepdaughters. And then I hate saying step, but just to give context here, I have two stepdaughters and then my biological son, but I've been living with the girls now for five years. So I feel like they're mom. So it's really hard to say step, but still, um, there were some, you know, conflict with, um, you know, going back and forth and I won't get into the, the, the nitty gritty of it, but I did get really frustrated at the dinner table and I said a snide remark about their mom and, um, I had to like go for a walk, leave the dinner table and come back and say that it was so inappropriate that I said that I was just feeling frustrated because we were trying to coincide weekends and it can be very frustrating trying to ensure kids are all on the same schedule. And um, yeah, I think there's a, your parents are going to slip up and I cannot overstate enough how important your apology is. And then Obviously, we have to try to do better, but it is going to happen. You are going to get, if you're a parent going through this, you're going to say something you didn't mean. You're going to eye roll. Um, you're going to you know, slam a door when that other parent leaves, whatever it is. Like you will get frustrated and you're human. That makes a lot of sense. And there's probably a lot of hurt there too when we go through a lot of this and um, co-parenting can be very tricky. So give yourself some grace and, and just learn the art of apologizing to your child. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. And it shows them too that we are messy and we're going to have days that we screw up just like they, just like they do. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, kids, when kids are going through this, understand we've completely turned their world upside down. And this isn't, I'm not trying to shame parents, like it, but it's turned their world upside down too. And so you've got to, I say grace for yourself and grace for your child. And, and what we see when we go through this really hard process is we're going to see you going through grief as a parent, your child is going through grief and there's stages to grief. And it's not um, as simple as it's not a straight line. It kind of pivots all over the place. Like we talk about, you know, being in denial and then having anger and having sadness and acceptance. And if we look at uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's model, it's not linear. Like you jump around and then the waves just get smaller as we go. Um, But what's important to understand is when your kids are going through, you know, all these different stages and pieces that they're going to regress. You know, it's really common to see kids all of a sudden have nightmares and want to co-sleep with you to wet the bed, to start thumb sucking. Um, These are all normal things to be preoccupied with. This is a huge one is, well, if you stopped loving mom or you stopped loving dad, will you stop loving me? That is a huge fear of kids. It's so hard for them to comprehend how two people who say they can love each other fall out of love. Mm -hmm. So if parents fall out of love, can they fall out of love with their kids? And that's such a huge message we have to, in counseling, we have to help children process is, and often I'll say to to kids, as I'll show them a cup and I'll show them how the cup like with water and it will pour out. And I said, sometimes moms and dads have love, but they lose their love for lots of different reasons. 
But I'll tell you what, that cup that parents have with their love with their kids, it's a magic cup. And no matter what that child does, I don't care if they yell or they break something or they weren't listening at school, that parent can never stop loving that child. It's just this magic. So we literally show kids with like a magic cup and then there's a cup that gets empty and it's completely different cups. Mm. And that's a really, that's a take home message that's like, I'm going to bring into counseling very quickly with kids because that is such a a fear for them that love is now conditional. That's so. beautiful. Oh, I love that. I love that. So that brings me to a question that I have. And I think what I would love to do with you today, Tammy, is go through how do we help kids before we separate and then during the separation and then after the separation? What are some of your key ideas? There? So let's say mom and dad have decided that they're going to separate, they're going to get divorced. What are some of the things that they need to keep in mind as they move forward with their kiddos? I think the first and foremost, we're going to keep it as simple as possible. Okay. And kids are going to be in shock and they're going to be in denial about this. And so we don't expect kids to be able to process this right away. It can take months for them to understand this, but I mean, if you can, is to sit down together with your kids. I mean, so if they're tiny, my son was only what, 18 months. So there was no sitting. He was little, but, um, yeah, he was 18 months. I had to think about how old he was. And with older kids, I say, you know, we sit down and say that mom and dad have decided. Now, some parents will say like, we're going to be friends. Make sure that's true. Very few parents (laughs) do that. And to say mom and dad, um, we don't have that same love we used to have. And we are better for you as moms and dads, if we are living in separate houses, I bet you, cause kids are really observant. I bet you notice that mom and dad aren't talking as much, or maybe you've been fighting a lot. So you say, we've been fighting a lot. This isn't good for our family. It doesn't feel good for you. It doesn't feel good for us. So it's really important that we take care of our hearts as parents. And it's going to be better if mom and dad, you know, maybe mom's getting an apartment or one parent staying in the house. So, I mean, there's so many different ways to separate what that's going to look like. Um, and then say to the kids, do you have questions about this? Like maybe dad's going to go live with grandma or, you know, however you decide. Um, and then at the end, I would definitely be saying, but this is one, not your fault because kids internalize everything must be their fault. They should have been able to do something. I think every child I've ever worked with has, I give them an inventory and every child I've worked with has said some part of them felt like they could have prevented it, that it was their fault. Mm -hmm. So that is a universal truth with kids who go through this. They assume they had some part to play in this. Mm -hmm. So immediately, and you're going to have to drill that home over and over and over. It's not your fault. We love you. We want the best for you. And we, you know, if if we can say, I respect, if the kids are old enough, you can say, I can, I can respect your dad or I respect your mom and we're going to do the best we can, but this is going to be hard for everybody. And then allow them to ask questions. Like kids are going to say, this is one of the first things to say, what's going to happen at birthdays and Christmas? Uh Like they're going to ask things about big family things. What about breakfast on Sundays? And so start thinking about these like traditions that you have and these big things that are really important to your kids and start thinking about that before you have this conversation. Um, And it's okay not to know. And it's okay Mm -hmm. to say to your kids, I don't have that answer for you. So we're going to come back in two days and I'm going to have answers for that, but I promise you will have an answer. We oh, are, love that. you know, yeah. dad or mom and I need to figure this out. Um, and just expect kids to be completely shocked and sad. You know, girls are more likely to internalize and boys will act out more quickly. So we have what's called with girls, a sleeper effect where often they'll try to like nurture everybody and they're going to keep everyone together and be strong. And then the boys will act out behaviorally. So it's really common for parents to want to bring me their son, not their daughter. And I'm like, no, 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 both kids. There is a delayed often onset of symptoms with girls versus boys. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. Um, Yeah, I had a, a, a couple come in who were separating and it was so beautiful because they came in before they'd spoken to the kids. So they had their narrative worked out. Um, I could recommend some books to them when the kiddos were ready. Not not in that first week or two, it's too much. But after a while, they started reading children's books to the kids so they could talk about the different characters and they could normalize a little bit. But it was just such a beautiful, I know we don't always have that luxury, but it was just such a slow process that I think was really helpful for the kids. 
Yeah, I always recommend if parents can see a counselor or a therapist or a psychologist to figure out how to divorce it. It's amazing if you can get that kind of, um, it's almost like a coach, a coach for like, this is how we do this process. So we don't see trauma with our kids. Um, what kids need, f f like the brainstem, Tanya and I talk about the different levels of the brain. First and foremost, kids need safety. And part of safety is predictability to know what's coming next. And that's why this is so hard initially. Kids don't know what's coming next. This is all they've known as their parents together. So what is that going to look like? What's school going to look like? You know, what are friends going to think, especially for our kids who are a little bit older? There's some shame there, like people are going to judge them. Um, you know, kids are like, what are bedtimes going to look like? What's Christmas going to look like? So leaving space for that, first and foremost, the brain is saying like, am I safe? Is life predictable? No, it's not. Oh my gosh, the alarm bells are going off. And the second question the child needs to know, like, am I loved? Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I said that. So that preeminent need there that often children question because the parents have decided to basically fall out. They not decided, they have fallen out of love. Or maybe it's just for the best. They do love each other. It's just, um, it's just affection instead of, you know, romantic love. Yeah. So we go, am I safe? Am I loved? And then I think as kids move through that divorce process, then we can go to the next part where it's, mm -hmm. we can start considering different perspectives and what does this mean for our family? Yeah. yeah. So when then we, we had to think about like what that looks like. So now you've talked to them and then we've, you're starting to come up with a plan. And because that brain's first question is, am I safe? And which is really about rhythm and predictability is how do we, um, how do we create some predictability? And this is where co-parenting comes in is how do we keep, um, schedules as, as consistent as we can. How do we, um, you know, I'm always, I'm always a huge believer that kids have stuff at both parents' houses so they don't have to cart things back and forth. Mm -hmm. That's very hard on kids. And I promise they don't like it. I've never had a child who enjoys taking a suitcase back and forth. Um, so, you know, there's clothes at mom's, clothes at dad's. Maybe it's their winter jacket and boots and like their school backpack that goes back and forth. So we have doubles of everything at each, at each home. Um, you know, we want to keep bedtimes the same. We want to keep meal times the same. And I think what parents will try to do to compensate because they feel so much guilt. They do. It, yeah. it is, you just feel horrible. I'm telling you, I went through this. You feel so guilty that we try to compensate by giving our kids everything and letting them stay up too late. And you're the Disneyland parent and you're taking them now swimming and extra camping and we're going to Disneyland and we're going to Mexico. We're doing all these things and we're not disciplining now because we don't want to like cause our children more pain. And these are things you should not be doing because that's not consistent with their schedule. That is not consistent with the world they know. That's actually creating more unpredictability mm -hmm. and more because we're not being consistent. We don't have our rituals. We don't have our rules. Like that's actually creating more chaos for your child when we don't keep things as the same as we can. Um, that means we have to deal with our own feelings of shame and inadequacy here. Our mm -hmm. kids are actually, we're putting that on our kids saying, I don't feel good as a parent. So I'm going to do all these other things, which is actually, I think is going to make you happy. And it might make them happy in that moment. It's, but it's a distraction from the grief and anger and sadness they're feeling. Totally. And we've lost what they need, that parent-child relationship, because now we're trying to be their friend. And so that yeah. relational consistency that they know is now gone too. So even though we go like, oh, you know, he's loving me or we're having such a good time together or he's not mad at me or maybe I'm the favorite parent. Now if that's coming into it too, what we've actually done is created um, anxiety for the child. Yeah. So we want to keep that rhythm and predictability. And you know what? I know it sounds like really good on paper, but parents fight and they won't want to, and they don't want to receive feedback. You know, they don't want to do things. There's, because there's often, you know, resentment that exists in these relationships. One parent wanted the marriage to stay intact and one didn't. Or, um, so I, that's hard. Like, I mean, ideally, this is what we want to strive towards. I realize you might get pushback from the other parent. And I just want to say you can own, you can't control another human being guys. So if the dad or mom is not following the rituals, not following the routine, you can't control what they do. All you can do is keep things consistent and predictable and you're Switzerland, you're neutral at your house. That's all you can do. And there's, ide you know, the ideal breakup and then there's a not so ideal breakup. So, you know, I, we can't force your ex-spouse to to jump on board with this. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there is a book called the, the co-parenting handbook 
that is excellent. I highly, highly recommend reading that to, that talks about a lot of these things you can do to get on the same page. It's one of the best books I've ever read um, on trying to get parents on the same page. But beautiful. it's really about ritual, routine, consistencies um, that exist. And I know another thing that's going to come up is going back and forth. And I've said keeping the same thing at both homes is really important. And then it's how often do they go? This is a huge one. Everyone's like, what does custody and access look like and how often? And And here's this. Yeah. And this is what I often recommend. If both parents can be harmonious and they can somewhat co-parent and get along and keep consistencies between the households and you have to like each other, but you can, you know, you can get along enough then I would say you can go a week in a week. You can go, you know, and I often say transition like on a Sunday evening and then um, Sunday or Fridays, you know, the end of the weekend or the beginning of the weekend. It might be easier for some parents on a Friday because then they have a couple days to kids always the first two days are a bit of a mess. Mm-hmm. So that can be hard, but for some kids, it's a, for my son, it's actually kind of nice because school school's a distraction the next day. So he's busy. So I yep. think it just kind of, but when he was little, it was Friday. So he had two days to kind of like get all the feelings out because they usually need, they need about two to two to three days to kind of, which is why I really do not recommend doing a two and three day back and forth. Like, no, because kids need two to three days just to like adjust to the other home. Mm-hmm. Now, this being said, um, there's the other arrangement, which is more traditional, which is like the, the kiddos staying a full time with one parent and visitation every other weekend, usually with like a Wednesday night dinner or something every week. And that's often recommended if, you know, one parent works away a lot. Um, you know, they just don't have the same interest in that, in that, or, um, they, maybe they're mental, they're really struggling with mental health and they can't be predictable and consistent for the child. Then that's probably the, the, the best, but, the the 50 50 is what when parents can be on the same page there isn't this huge rift but i would never ever recommend a child not seeing that parent typically unless there's safety concerns but even then we would probably look Mm -hmm. at supervised visits yeah of course there are exceptions to every rule but like for the most part with kids going back and forward is there a favorite ritual that you have Mm -hmm. thank you for keeping me on track here yeah, so it would be, um, I really love this. I'm trying to remember where I learned it from. It might have been Jessica Joel Alexander. I don't know. I, I read it somewhere. And it's this candlelight ritual that I recommend that parents do is when the child transitions back into the home, you do it in the evening, is turn all the lights down or go into a room where you can black out the curtains, you know, mm-hmm. and you light a candle and you can sit with them. And we, and there's something about candlelight that's very warm and comforting and cozy. And there they can share all the good things that happened that week and the things that were really hard that week. And we're not, we're not, this is an inquisition. We're open, we're curious. And then what are some things they're looking forward to with the week with you? And this is where you can say this week, we're doing this, 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 and this is creating rhythm, predictability, also leaving space to share um, about the things that are hard. Now, Imagine your child says something's really hard about dads or moms. Dad yelled at me that week, or he said bad things about you, mommy. This happens. Like we, we hope parents can put their egos aside, but they don't always. And you know what? My first thing is to say, and it sounds like mom or dad is having really big feelings right now. And sometimes when our feelings get really big, we don't make the best choices, but your dad your mom loves you the best they know how. Mm, and we beautiful. seriously, that's what we say. We don't say, well, you should tell your dad X, Y, and Z. That makes a kid a messenger and we don't do that. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. adult. Those are adult conversations we have. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, to talk about those adult conversations, um, I think always remember that we are our child's shield. You know, I think sometimes I hear from parents, well, he needs to know that this is not okay. And it's like, no, 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 no. Your child is still little. You are his shield. If there's something you need to share with the parent, we share it directly, but not in those moments. No, and not just having the child say, you know, this is how you tell your dad this and try this. No, we will have those discussions in hopefully a very um, a careful, considerate way of the other other parent too, and how they might receive that. Probably criticism is not the best way to deliver anything or attacking them. Um, but that ritual, I really, really like to mm, to be able to beautiful. do that. I love that. And then as, as families start to settle into their new rhythm, um, 
as partners maybe enter the picture do you have any words of <laughs> suggestion there is that another, yeah, is that another is podcast it, it's <laughs> another podcast uh okay so I'm just going to talk statistically here for a second. Okay. This is no judgment on any particular family, but we know men on average tend to introduce their new partner more quickly than women do. Men remarry much faster than women do. Okay. I I could go into lots of reasons why this is. It's just, uh, anyway, it's just, just we're different that way. So women will take their time. Right. So here I'm going to give credit to our gender here for a second that, you know, waiting is, is, better. And I say you should be in a best case scenario. You are waiting six months. You date for six months and you know that person is going to be an integral part of your life. You love them. You're committed. Wait six months. And then once you do, we introduce as a friend, um, Kids are often smart. They're like, that's not your friend. You're holding hands. And you can say, well, yes, I, you know, this is my girlfriend. Like kids will call you on it if they don't buy it. Sometimes it's so, but I'd start with friend and just see how they roll with it. Mm -hmm. Some kids are much more perceptive. We don't lie. Um, and then, cause they are your friend, like to be fair, like they might be a girlfriend, but we're just using selective truth at this point, just to help them adjust to this idea. And then as we go, we can introduce them most. Yes. Like I love this person. And that's the nice thing by six months, you probably know if you love them or not. So you can say these things. Mm -hmm. And then once they're introduced, we don't jump into sleepovers. We don't jump into huge family vacations. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. And I talk about my blended family course, like one of the biggest mistakes, and this will gar almost guarantee that this relationship will not work out, is you expect you all to be a family immediately. You're not. I mean, there was another family that existed far before this. And trying to force that on kids will blow up eventually in your face. Mm -hmm. So trade lightly. Tread lightly. And it's a slow process and there is questions and that child still feels loyal to the other parent. Understand that. And this is a threat. And I don't care how wonderful this human being is. It's still a threat to their relationship with that other parent. Mm -hmm. And maybe that child's had that parent. To, this happened to me. Um, it was very difficult for one of my kids to adjust to her father um, dating me, not because there was anything wrong with what I was doing with her. She had just had her dad to herself for years. Cause my husband waited years before dating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it was very hard and she still struggles with it. It's been five years. It's still hard for her. It never stopped being hard. She remembers being her dad, being her, her person. So, you know, these, these, they evolve and get easier, but it's still hard on kids. Even years later, my son still, when he comes back from his dad's or he's transitioning to his dad's, he still, he, this has been how many years has this been now? It's been five and a half, six years, six years. And he still says, why can't you and dad live in the same house? I hate going back and forth. This is hard. Why can't you like buy houses next to each other? And so it still comes up after all this time. It's I still, and all I say is it's really hard when mom and dad live in different houses, isn't it? I'm not trying to fix it. I'm not trying to justify it. It's just hard. This sucks, doesn't it? And we often just say it, it sucks. It's so hard. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, I, I, you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that grief, that it comes in waves at different times. It's not like adults grieve. It's a very different process for kiddos. And so this is grief coming in different waves at different developmental stages. Yeah. Another thing to say is, and you know, this will hopefully resonate with some parents is you probably weren't getting along with your spouse when you decided to, to separate. There's a reason why you decided to not be together. And maybe it was simply it cold indifference. Maybe you weren't fighting. Um, my ex and I were not fighting. That is not why we split up. We just were kind of turned into friends is what had happened. So it wasn't entirely untrue that we were just friends. Um, but with this, this happening, um, we can just say to our kids, I'm a better mom. And I can, I say this to my son, I am a better mom and I am a happier person now that I'm with Alan and you're, you know, you're, that's my husband. And then, you know, I'll say your dad is happier, you know, with, with your stepmom because they brought out the best in us. Like we're better for you, buddy, because we're not together. And I don't know if he quite understands that, but I'm going to keep saying it till that's it starts beautiful. to make sense. But we do talk about our, cause it's our happiness too. We're modeling healthy relationships to our kids. And this is what I want you for parents who feel guilty. 
your marriage was probably not, if you, if this didn't work out, probably wasn't maybe the ideal marriage to demonstrate to your child. And we want to pick a partner who brings out the best in us because we want to demonstrate what a healthy marriage or relationship looks like. And so you're doing your family a service if this relationship was not healthy and you're choosing to exit. And whether you end up with someone else or not, maybe he'll just, your child will just see what it's like to see a parent who's autonomous and relies on extended family and friendships to have healthy dynamics. It doesn't have to be a romantic relationship as long as it's a healthy relationship, whether it's friendship or relying on family or having a new partner, you are, you're the example. So if your marriage wasn't a good example, if you don't want your child to be in when they're married, think 20 years, is this the kind of relationship I want my child to be in? If the question is no, then don't feel bad about leaving. Like we want them to see what healthy relationships look like. Oh. Beautiful. So Tim, I actually feel like that's a beautiful place for us to end the podcast. I think that's a very, very strong message to parents. Is there any final thoughts that you want to give parents before we leave? You know, the relationship that you had with your spouse has ended, but that relationship that you have with your child is just still beginning. It's evolving and growing. So you have every opportunity to help your child heal and move towards health just because your marriage didn't end. Doesn't mean your child's family is done. You're, you're still family. The dad, the mom, you know, two moms, two dads, grandparents, like it's still family. It just looks a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And as long as we follow, um, we, we respect that other parent. We don't have to love them. We don't have to like them. You just have to respect that that is their, the other parent, that child loves them. And we work on safety consistency, predictability, and letting child know that they are loved no matter what, kids will bounce back from this. And if you need more support, if you follow the, the description of this podcast, if you scroll down, we have a whole course on divorce and separation and helping kids heal from this. It gives you strategies and rituals and research and what to say, what not to say when kids ask questions and blended families and intro and we'll include the link to the blended families as well like how to introduce a spouse and how when you get remarried what to do um i'm really passionate about both those topics blended families as well as uh, families who are divorcing or separating so we are happy to provide some guidance uh, with those two courses you can find them in the in the links below thanks Amy. that was a jam-packed podcast uh, thank you everybody for listening in today